Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, client wanted to talk to male employee, but only I, the woman, could help him. The second story, new boss punishes being late, the crew then follows every rule to the letter, and no work gets done. The third story, Karen set the rules and checked every meal the employees brought. The first story is, Oh, you want a man? Uh, okay. I work in a field that's dominated by men. In fact, in my office of 30-ish people, only three of us are female. My direct boss, one of our QA reps, and myself. My job is a mix of technical support and customer service, in a niche industry, and I've worked at my company for nearly 15 years doing the same job. Small company and not a lot of room to move, as we tend to stick around. We deal with clients worldwide, and my department consists of six people. Generally, we have two to three on phones at any given time, one on chat, and the other two working on different queues. At least two to three times a week I'm mistaken by clients as the secretary and asked to be transferred to tech support. My standard response is, I'm part of tech support, what can I help you with today? And they're happy to work with me. Occasionally, maybe once every couple of years, someone will tell me they want to talk to a male or more senior rep. My boss is fine with me accommodating these requests, as long as we don't have a queue. On this particular day, we had me and our newest team member, who had been with the company maybe a year at this point. He's now been with the company over five years. Two of our team members had the day off, and it was later in the day, so the third phone person had finished their shift and gone home. It was busy and we had a bit of a queue, and the new guy had a pretty difficult issue that he had been on the call for about 30 minutes. It was also when our management had their off-site, so we literally had no management in the office. I answer a call. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client. Can you transfer me to support? Me. I am in support. How can I help you today? Client. Transfer me to a man. Women don't work in support. Me. I'm sorry, sir. All our other representatives are on calls right now. How can I assist you today? Client hangs up. I take the next two calls, no issue. The third call is the same caller. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client, can you transfer me to support? Me, I am in support. The client hangs up before I can offer to assist him again. I take another two calls, all the meanwhile helping the new guy where I can, as he's now about an hour on the call. Next call, yup, the same guy. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client, can you transfer me to support? Me, I am in support. How can I help you today? Client, transfer me to a man. Women don't work in support. Me, I'm sorry, sir. All our other representatives are on calls right now. Client, I am not working with a woman. I want your manager. Me, I'm sorry. The manager's not in her office at this time. Client, no, I want a male manager. Me, I'm sorry. All the managers are away from their desks in a meeting at this time. I can request that one call you back when they're available. The client hangs up. At this point, the queue is clear, and I continue to help the new guy with his issue. Five minutes later, I get a call. It's the same guy. Me. Thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client. Can you transfer me to support? Me. I am in support. How can I help you today? Client hangs up. Immediately, he calls back and I answer again. We have caller ID, so I can see it's the same guy. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? He hangs up. This repeats about six times before I think he finally gave up. The new guy and I are close to fixing his client's issue. Maybe 10 minutes have passed since the guy stopped calling. When he calls back. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name or account number? Client, is there a mail available yet? The new guy fixes the issue and hangs up offers to take the call. Me, yes, one moment while I transfer you to another rep. Client, finally. I transfer the call and the new guy answers. The client's issue is rather difficult and after five minutes he asks for a more senior rep as the new guy doesn't know what he's doing. Client's words, not mine. The new guy looks at me and mouths, he wants a senior rep, to which I nod and he transfers the call back to me. Me, thank you for calling company support. This is OP. Can I get your name and account number? Client, I asked for a senior rep, not a female. Me, sir, I am the senior rep available right now. I've been with the company for over 10 years. Obviously, I know what I'm doing or I wouldn't still work here. 
The client reluctantly allows me to assist him, and it took me less than 15 minutes to get him going again, as it was an issue we knew about with the version released when I started, and as the new guy never dealt with the older versions, he was still learning the legacy protocols. To the client's credit, they've never asked me to talk to a male again, and more often than not asked to talk to the female in support when they call. The second story is, I don't make the rules, I just have to follow them. Now for a little background. I work as a civilian doing aircraft maintenance and overhaul on USAF, US Air Force planes. As anyone who has any ties to the military or any federal organization can tell you, malicious compliance happens all the time. We even joke that if we followed every rule in the book, we would never get any work done. So on to the story. The base I work at is adjacent to a highway, and beside that a railroad. Anyone coming from town has to cross the railroad to get to one of the gates. There's only one gate with a bridge over the railroad, but it's on the far side of the base from the flight line area where we work. Every so often the stars align just right, and there's a long train that makes you a little late for work. Most of the supervisors understand this, and there's even an authorization for them to give you up to one hour daily for such reasons. At their discretion, of course. One day in particular, as my coworkers and I are heading to work, the train is stopped. No signs of moving. So I see several cars turning around and decide to do the same, to head to the far gate with the bridge. This roundabout trip causes me and several others to walk in a few minutes, less than five. We had a new team supervisor, and he said that he would charge everyone who was late 15 minutes leave. When we protested, he said the words that we would make haunt him. I don't make the rules, I just have to follow them. Cue the malicious compliance. First, as we were now on our time for the next 10 minutes, we promptly told the supervisor he could hold off on handing out job assignments until we were on their time again. Most of the guys went to smoke a cigarette. Everyone was seated back at the meeting area when our time was up, but we weren't done yet. As the supervisor is handing out job assignments, I look him in the eye and ask him for a work card. Per the rules, when an assignment is handed out, a card must be handed with it. This rarely gets done unless we ask for one, but even then it can be difficult to do at times. The supervisor says that he will print one later, but I promptly remind him that the rules state that we will have a card before starting our assigned task. Everyone else follows suit and asks for a card. You can already see the look of dread in the supervisor's eyes, as he knows he's in for a long night. It takes him nearly an hour to find and print all of the required cards. With cards in hand, it's off to my inventory toolbox. At the time, the regulations stated that toolboxes must be inspected three times a day at minimum. Start of shift before lunch and end of shift. It also must be inspected when changing tasks. A proper toolbox inspection can take an hour or more, as you're supposed to look at every tool and make sure it's etched with your toolbox number. We all start our inspections. Supervisor comes around asking why we aren't on the plane yet and gets informed that we're all inspecting our boxes. I smile and tell him I don't make the rules, I just follow them. He just shakes his head and walks off. By the time we all get our boxes inspected, it's time for a break. So we pop off for a quick break and come back to gear up for our job. With tools in hand, we head out to the aircraft and find that there's no support equipment on site. This would be air compressors, lights for after it gets dark, and stands to work off of in the higher areas. After notifying the at this point frustrated supervisor, he stays to stand by while he gets some delivered to us. The first equipment rolls up about 45 minutes before lunchtime. But remember the regs about toolboxes? We all head back in and put everything up to do a box inventory. Supervisor doesn't even say anything as he walks by shaking his head. Lunch comes and goes, and we start the second half of the night. We tool up again and head out to the plane ready to start work. We start our task, get about an hour and a half in and take a break. After break, we work another half an hour or so before we head in to do a final tool inventory, an end of shift meeting. We ended up accomplishing nothing that night. We did, however, cause our supervisor to get completely reamed the next day. We kept much of this game up for the coming days until the new supervisor decided to chill out a bit. And as far as I know, he's never charged anyone for being a few minutes late again. The last story is, you need to check all of our food, fine. So this happened like seven or eight years ago when I was jobbing at a driving service while I was a student. The driving service was one for people with disabilities that could not drive or walk on their own. Our main office was in the building of a housing slash working facility for disabled people. The two companies, our driver service and the housing facility, were loosely connected as they were both financed by the same organization. However, management wise, they were clearly separated. We were about 15 drivers at this location and we shared our lunch and social room with about 10 caretakers. Since our schedules were horribly organized, the drivers often had idle time so the social room was where everybody hung around waiting for work. One day my boss, call him Tom, brought cake to work because he became 60. The cake was enormous, like a wedding cake could hide behind it twice, 
I can only imagine how expensive it must have been. At nine, every driver had eaten some pieces, and there was still like 80% left of it, so Tom told the caretakers they should feel free to take some. The cake was in fact specially ordered. It wasn't a very festively decorated cake, or anything, but anyone could see this was done by someone who knew his business. Then Karen happened. She was something like the security inspector of the facility, so she had authority over the caretakers, but no dealings with the driving service. Her job was to watch for potential hazards, organize the caretaker's schedule, and generally having an eye on everything happening. When she heard there was cake, she was furious. She and Tom couldn't stand each other, so she was always trying to ruin his day. In this particular instance, she claimed the cake was a health hazard, as it contained cream, and she could not verify whether the cooling chain was never broken during transport. So she threw it all away. Roughly 400 euros worth of food just thrown away. Needless to say, Tom was less than amused. He went extremely mad. He was usually a very calm and gentle man, and this was the only time ever that I heard him shouting at someone. Still, there was nothing he could do. Karen could basically declare anything a hazard and take action how she saw fit, and her higher-ups didn't really care. To make matters worse, she doubled down and demanded that every food that was brought into the social room had to be inspected by her first. Cue malicious compliance. Obviously, all the drivers were mad at Karen for upsetting Tom and for throwing away a perfectly fine cake. So the next day, first thing in the morning, 15 drivers went to her office. Everyone with his lunch demanding she inspected. It took her roughly 10 minutes looking at sandwiches and answering questions, whether mayonnaise was too hazardous to be brought in. This went on for the whole week, each day our questions about hazardous foods becoming more dumb and degenerate. On Friday, it took her more than two hours to inspect our lunch, as we would collectively steal her time. Afternoon, she said she got the message, and that sandwiches got a general okay, and not to bother her with it anymore. Fine. The following week, we went out of our way to eat anything but sandwiches. Salads, cake, pretzels, normal lunch stuff. Every day there was a line in front of her office having their lunch checked, asking stupid questions whether this food was or was not too dangerous to enter the social room. Karen was losing her patience, becoming increasingly aggressive towards us but still refused to apologize to Tom. Then at the end of week two of food checking, Tom brought a bucket for lunch. When he entered Karen's office to have his lunch checked, like he did every day, and opened the lid of his lunch pot, the smell hit everyone in the vicinity like a brick to the face. Apparently, he had made some unholy mix of garlic, cream, pickles, and herring, which he called fish soup. It looked like what happens if you leave something dead in the sun for too long, all brownish and sluggy with some green specks in it, and it reeked twice as bad as it looked. Karen looked as if she would puke any moment, commanding him to remove this monstrosity from her office. Tom asked if she didn't want to check it, since he could manage the cooling chain could have been broken during transport or sometime in the last two weeks. The lot of us drivers laughed so hard, I swear some nearly choked from laughter. This was roughly the time that Karen had to admit defeat. Food checking stopped immediately, and the following week Tom brought another cake. I hope you love these stories. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to know when the new videos come out.